The burning of Prospero, despite the verb that denotes it, was not one act. Few things are in the grand sweep of history, but this event is one so wrapped up in narratives, personalities, agendas, ideologies, and the sheer weight of time itself that it forms a mass that appears to pull in everything around it, bending the fabric of the past by its sheer influence alone. Threads weave into this tale from unexpected corners, with each new examination of what fragments of Chronicle's past remain, new possibilities emerge. What one has compiled is one's own truest account of what occurred, but even then the dread weight of the past itself will inevitably reopen wounds of conjecture and supposition. For as with so much of the past, what was is clouded by ignorance, redaction, and vested interest. What you shall find in this tale's telling, dearest acolyte, is as much of the truth as can be managed. But as any good historator knows, truth is a fickle bell dam, coyly luring away the unworthy with promises and trapping them inside prisons of their own biases. Alas, one has not the time to lecture upon the means of ethical and legitimate scholarship of times gone by. But simply put, possess within yourselves an inquiring spirit and a mind open to doubt. Far from the maxims of the Inquisition, a mind too small for it is an ill thing indeed. Know then that this is a record of the gathering storm of the Emperor's judgment, the means by which the Crimson King would be brought to justice, the gathering of the censure host. Contrary to the wild imaginations of some, the process for mustering the force that would bring the displeasure of the Master of Mankind to the planet of Magnus the Red was not a rapid affair, even with the superlative abilities of those who would lead it. Terra's astropathic communication networks had been thrown into absolute chaos by the Crimson King's works, the choirs rushing to replace those who had been driven mad or simply killed outright by the psychic maelstrom unleashed upon the assault of the homeworld's etheric defenses. It was not for several solar weeks that word of what happened, and word of what would now happen in response, would reach the two off-world points that mattered most. The vengeful spirit, flagship of the War Master, Horus Lupercal, and Fenris, icebound fife of the Sixth Legion Astartes, the Vilka Fenrica, commonly, if always informally, known as the Space Wolves. Unsurprisingly, the records of just what transpired in this time period are fragmentary, both due to the infrastructural devastation wrecked upon Terra, the whims of warp chronodilation, and of course the loss of archival records during the Great Heresy. But it appears that, at least initially, the muster was spearheaded by the Captain General of the Legio Custodes, Constantin Valdor. The Emperor, absent from public and military life for years at this point, did not emerge from the palace at any time during or following the chaos. Authority from within the Imperial household flowed from the font of Valdor, first of the Ten Thousand, and Malkador the Sigilite, from his position as head of the Council of Terra both now furiously occupied in bringing stability back to the tumultuous throne world. To the Captain General was delegated the responsibility of mustering the force of arms to be known as the Censure Host, although it was always understood that eventual command would be granted to Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Sixth Legion, as under the Imperial Junta government the Primarchs shared equal authority, second only to the Emperor. In terms both judicial and practical, Valdor was likely perfectly fine with this arrangement. Had his personal feelings upon the matter, or indeed any matter, ever been a consideration to his comportment of his duties, anyone who states thus clearly does not know the custodies. The Captain General was a leader and a warrior considered second only to the Primarchs. 
Indeed, many have long speculated that in terms of sheer combat prowess, he would have been the equal or better of many of them. Although one finds such petty, power, dynamic bickering trivial and ultimately pointless. It was Valdor's stated and consistent position to remain as perfectly neutral from all aspects of imperial politics, be they martial or temporal, as he and by extension the Legio Custodes could possibly be. Intervention was only ever undertaken under the explicit direction of the Emperor himself, or when Valdor's own judgment concluded that either these orders or the Emperor's personage was at risk. Valdor's appointment to this position within the censure host was both the natural result of his position at the highest military authority on the throne world, and as well a considered choice, as the importance of the host's mission could under no circumstances fall prey to the Imperium's oft divisive politics. The Council of Nikia was still fresh upon the minds of many, even years later, and many of these would damn Magnus a traitor for the actions he had taken, disrupting the stated mission of the host, which was to bring Magnus before his father, the Emperor, in person. Additionally, the legendary composure of Valdor was likely considered vital in reigning in the more bellicose character of Liman Rus, known as one of the most willful Primarchs amongst the Brotherhood. Finally, as the bearer of the Magisteria Maxima, the Emperor's own judicial seal, Valdor had supreme legal authority under the Lex Imperialis, possessing the full legitimacy of the military regime's government. In the immediate term, the Captain General had no difficulty in securing the core of the censure host from the local volume. Although it had been 200 years since unification and the Solar Reclamation, the Sol system, and Terra specifically, was the greatest fortress humanity had ever possessed, and was manned accordingly. Diverse armed forces from both humanity's core worlds and its recently conquered regions were present in both ceremonial and specifically defensive roles. These included Astartes from all legions, the so-called Crusader host, as well as the Solar Auxilia, the Exertus Imperialis, soldiers in their millions, as well as thousands of Mechanicum Tagmata, both Martian and otherwise, and hundreds of god engines of the Collegia Titanica. Valdor's choices from these formed a cocktail of the powerful, the exotic, the arcane, and the influential. After all, the host's primary purpose was as escort for Magnus the Red, however imprisoned the Crimson King was to be during the voyage. Such an event was both punishment for the Primarch's crimes and a message to the Imperium, a demonstration of the fate that would be suffered if any others chose to defy the Emperor's writ, no matter their station. Fittingly, the forefront would represent the Emperor's auric judgment, a vanguard of the Legio Custodes itself. 982 warriors of the 10,000, representing 91 individual sodalities of the Legio. Supplementing them in unaugmented manpower were the regiments of the Exertus, with the bulk being 5,000 troopers from the Third Tyrannic, the Ironside regiments of Old Albia. Alongside them were 4,000 hoplites from the 9th Solar Auxiliary Cohort, one of the renowned Saturnine Rams regiments that had founded this wing of the Imperial Auxilia during the Solar Reclamation. The 10th and 42nd Sacrosang Valtiguers provided 3,000 light and reconnaissance infantry for service, while eight Tyrian Exoguard regiments offered up 600 void-armored heavy infantry and 100 or so of their helots. Finally, the Karanid Sentinels were levied of 2,000 of their men-at-arms, all of which were amongst the most augmented baseline human troops within Saul's Light, bearing weaponry and equipment allowed to no other Exertus regiment, as befitted their stations, as wardens of the vast volumes between the planets and stations of humanity's home system. Despite the presence of so many Tagma within the system at the time, it curiously does not appear that the Mechanicum of Mars were contacted to provide these military elements for the host. Indeed, that they were included at all appears to have been a direct result of a late and highly pointed request made to Valdor by the Fabricator General Kelbor Hal himself, 
subsequent to the time that word of the host's formation had reached Warmaster Horus. If the Captain General had desired to make the censure a completely imperial affair, keeping Mars, the Fabricator General, and the Synod out of the proverbial loop, it appears he either underestimated their desire to play a role in such a pivotal event, or was outmaneuvered politically, for means either mundane or, in dreadful hindsight, ominous. Consequently, the Sidonian Tagmata was attached to the host, formed of Tagma drawn from Ekris, Norn, and Ifrem, as well as Mars herself, with the stated purpose of the inspection, assessment, and, if necessary, impounding and disassemblage of any technology found upon Prospero that Mechanicum Dogma prohibited. These were the most visible elements of the censure host. Valdor, of course, was not content in merely utilizing the mundane forces at his disposal. Indeed, considering the legion he was tasked with standing before, far more exotic formations were called for. To the Somnus citadel upon Luna, Terra's sole natural satellite, a missive was dispatched, and it was one that was answered immediately. Three thousand sisters militant of the Divisio Telepathica's Investigatis wing, commonly known by those aware of their existence as the Silent Sisterhood, answered Valdor's summons, constituting three full vigils and associated Charon pattern acquisitor grav tanks. Additionally, far to the west of the Imperial Palace upon Terra, a black-clad representative made his presence noted to Valdor and the host's command cadre, notifying the Captain General, it should be noted history is unclear if this figure had been requested or not, that the Chamber Occidentalis of the Ordo Sinister was at full combat readiness. Five Warlord Sinister-class Psy Titans, the most horrific and terrible weapons ever constructed by the Emperor's own hand, were embarked upon their ebon transport barks and awaiting deployment, along with 100,000 Secutarii Sinister, the Ordo's bespoke Secutarii Titan Guard. Between the Sisterhood and the Ordo, the censure host would boast what was possibly the most potent anti psyker military force ever assembled in one place by the Imperium. Certainly, while the Ordo is known to have engaged in several psycho-arcane purgation engagements throughout the Great Crusade, records are of course significantly redacted, it is unlikely to impossible that five of their Psy Titans had ever been deployed simultaneously or against any one foe, even in operations undertaken against, say, Asuriani craft worlds or Crave infestations. Certainly, this was reflected in the command cadre that formed the core of authority within the host. Constantine Valdor was naturally the apex, but at his right hand stood Janisha Kroll, the vigil commander of the Sisters of Silence herself. Below them, authority for the unaugmented troops lay with High Marshal Marcus Roan of the Third Tyrannic Auxilia, while at his side, outside the chain of command, Dominus Zalatkus, Thrain Esmark, Prefect of the Chamber Occidentalis, commanded the Psy Titans. The Mechanicum, as you may see, had no say in command authority. Their tagmata was expected to defer to Valdor, Kroll, and Esmark, depending on situational demands. The Custodes and the Exertus were the public face of the censure host. Such a rapid collection of military might in the near space of Terra could not escape the notice of many, no matter the supreme authority of those that were directing it. The Emperor's writ of censure had been made explicitly public. All present upon the throne world, with half a lick of sense, knew that the Custodes were forming an expedition to capture the Cyclops of Prospero. Few, of course, knew the identity of the beaconless, black-hulled craft that lurked within the flotilla, for few, if any, knew of the existence of the Silent Sisterhood beyond rumour, and fewer still, the existence of the Ordo Sinister. Neither of these formations were for the eyes of the masses. Let the Custodes march along parade grounds, as the Emperor's justice manifests. Within the hulls of these ships lay his ultimate weapons against the Aetheric. Their presence there, and our ability to confirm this in history, 
a testament to the totality of intent behind the order to bring Magnus to task by any means necessary. Clearly, there was hope that the Crimson King would simply surrender himself to his father's judgment. Just as clearly, the unthinkable other outcome that he may resist, and by force, was clearly being considered, and without any mercy. Was a display of power, a demand for contrition, even the use of dread, ever the truly stated aim? <laughs> More on that to come. Regardless of the urgency of the task, and the superlative abilities of those commanding it, it would nevertheless take several months to properly assemble and arm the Censure host within Terran space. This was as much to do with the simple processes of logistical demands any such assemblage would require, as it was to do with the sheer chaos Magnus's actions had wrecked upon the administrative infrastructure of the Sol system. Additionally, the import of the action was lost upon none, with the senior staff of all wings of the host sequestering themselves in the most secretive chambers of the Divisio Militaris headquarters, to study in detail the intelligence that existed about the Prosperine system, its locales, and its potential defenses. Valdor personally demanded the presence of Atharva, the single Astartes representative of the Thousand Suns present within Saul's light at the time of Magnus's folly. Through debriefings likely intense, Atharva was interrogated about his homeworld, his legion, and his Primarch, willingly surrendering what information he could to the host. It appears that at this point the idea that Magnus would somehow resist was not actively in consideration, at least not in the minds of Valdor and Malkador. Both believed the Sisterhood and the Ordo Sinister to be weapons of absolute last resort. One such as Valdor would never be given over to emotional considerations, being a man of deep, faultless practicality. The possibility that Magnus would be in open rebellion before him was scant, not a total impossibility, however, so he would be equipped accordingly. That being said, there were within the host those who, on no uncertain terms, were eager to believe the worst of Magnus and his legion. So, whatever the feelings of the Captain General, they were preparing for the worst, or even perhaps relishing the possibility. Strictly speaking, this forward military planning, the assessment of defenses, this was a contingency, nothing more, a necessity in the event of a worst-case scenario. Strictly speaking, that is. Under these assumptions, did the censure host slip anchor over Terra, bound outwards from the solar reaches for the onward muster at Beta Garmin. There, it was hoped, the host would rendezvous with the forces of the Sixth Legion and the Primarch Liman Rus. The astropathic choirs, messages of grave import long since delivered, now turned their attentions to making the writ of censure known as far and wide across the galaxy as possible. As the Censure host left the system, the mimetic dream code of deepest gravity leapt from the minds of Terra's astropaths across all Memno communication hubs. The Emperor was broadcasting his word. This was the fate of those who had breached his trust, and there would be none spared from the might of his lex. At the time of the Declaration of Censure, the Sixth Legion, the Vilka Fenrica, were believed to have been engaged in at least six major crusade campaigns, with Lehman Russ, as was his wont, at the forefront of the most deadly of these, engaged in the xenocide of the Scaric in the volume of Cipramundi. Due to the particular idiosyncrasies of the Sixth Legion, the wolves that stalked the stars kept few to little written records. All we know of Russ's reception of the news comes from the sagas as related by their rune priests, as well as Divisio Militaris, logistical and transit logs. The former tells tales of the Wolf King's towering rage at the perfidy of his brother, cursing him to any who would bear to stand against the fury as a sorcerer in Thrall to darkest Maleficarum. The latter shows that Russ quit the field of battle at Cipramundi and made for the Legion's homeworld of Fenris with a haste that was almost unseemly, 
speaking to his zeal that he possessed for the task he had been assigned, or perhaps fury at the actions of his brother. Certainly, the announced departure of Russ and the Wolves from the Scaric Purgation drew outraged protestations from the commanders of the Imperial Army, as it threw the entirety of the campaign planning into disarray. Not content to leave a battle mid-fight, Russ instead opted to disregard the previous Imperial strategy of methodical but consistent extermination, instead massing the entirety of his Astartes forces into a single strike upon the Xenos core world, ignoring outlying systems. The victory was of course won, and in short order, but at no small cost. While the world Warren had been reduced to a phosphex-choked ash wasteland, Several thousand space wolves had died in the process, and although the source of the Scaric infestation had been removed from play, there yet lay many more worlds under the thrall of the Xenos. Nevertheless, judging his contribution and honor satisfied, Russ and his fleet made full wake out system, leaving the Imperial Army to finish the work that remained. It is known that these regiments fared very poorly without Astarte's support spending many more years than had been initially planned finishing this xenocide, at the cost of several hundred thousand soldiers. Russ brought with him a complement of wolves that had, prior to the assault upon the Scaric core world, numbered some 20,000 Astartes, the entirety of On and Sep, the first and seventh of the Legion's great companies. The former consisted of the Wolf King's Huskar retinue, as well as the Legion's foremost companies and the vast majority of its Terminator Astartes. The latter, known within the Legion as the Black Cull, formed the bulk of the Vilka's Destroyer Corps, as well as those afflicted with rage-inducing Geno deficiencies that marked them out for inclusion in the Legion's Death Sworn divisions. As the pack travelled to Fenris, Russ made all possible attempts to contact the remainder of his legion, redoubling his efforts once enshrined within the cold halls of the Fang, the holdfast upon the ice world itself. Again, we must trust to the sagas and interpret what Divisio Militaris records remain, but it does not appear that Russ spent any more time on Fenris than a month Terran standard, allowing only such time as was absolutely needed for On and Sep to repair critical arms and armaments, and to count their dead. There would be no time for the depleted 1st and 7th companies to reinforce themselves, nor indeed would there be any time for those wolves furthest from the Legion to make it to their homeworld, or to beat a Garmin, in the time that Russ demanded they do. This issue of replenishment of the ranks was in fact a substantial one for the Legion as a whole during this period. The wolves habitually engaged with foes, and in a manner that, to be blunt, courted a higher body count than was strictly speaking necessary. All of their campaigns were entered into under the assumption, and indeed perhaps resignation or desire, that they would be bloody and painful. Despite their legendary self-reliance, second only perhaps to the 5th Legion White Scars, many of the wolves' great companies that answered the summons of their Jarl of Jarls were in dire need of replenishment. Those included Four, Fortois, and Tolf, the 4th, 8th, and 12th great companies. Russ would and could not spare them the time required to bring them to standard, even 6th Legion standard, and the sagas claim that his blood was up to almost Berserkar levels. The Cyclops awaited him on that far-off world, and he would not be denied. Russ departed Fenris as soon as he was able, at the head of 50,000 Astartes, and, by the quirks of the warp, arrived at Beta Garmin ahead of Constantine Valdor. Thanks to both the Sixth Legion's Saga of Prospero, remembrances of senior Exertus officers amongst the Terran contingent, and the superlative work conducted by the chronicler Julius Heraclastes Binsuldam in His Eye Diminished, The Burning of Prospero, The Demise of the Fifteenth Legion, and The Breaking of the Cyclops, with further observations upon the Calamity of the Sorcerers. We have a surprisingly accurate record of the force that Valdor found waiting once the Terran wing of the Censure Host broke from the warp. The Space Wolves, naturally, made up the bulk of the contingent, 
and indeed comprised the vast majority of the legion that was contemporarily available in active service, some 73,000 Astartes. On, the first great company, the Breakers of Rings, were 3,000 strong, most of these being senior commanders, as well as the legion's Varagir Terminator elite. Twa, the second great company, the Threadcutters, were only 800 in number, being primarily engaged elsewhere, but a large number of these were veteran infantry, as well as dreadnought sarcophagi. Tra, the third company, the Eagle's Keepers, were almost entirely recently initiated Astartes, assigned to close infantry assault duties, and were one of the largest, at 9,800 Astartes. Four, the fourth great company, the Bloodworms Masters, were heavy infantry and self-propelled artillery, 8,600 strong. Fife, the fifth great company, the Blood Ice Storm, had been present on Fenris for inductee training and replenishment, and thus comprised of a combined arms force of 10,000 Astartes. Sep, the seventh, the Black Cull, as noted earlier, had been with Russ at Cipramundi, now boasting 5,200 Astartes, almost all destroyers or death sworn. Four Twa, the eighth great company, the Slaughter Fire Heralds were 9,500 strong, dedicated primarily to reconnaissance and forward infiltration. Tra Tra, the ninth great company, the Serpents of the Battle Moon, were infantry support, special weapons teams, and rapier heavy battery platforms, at 7,800 Astartes. Elev, the eleventh great company, the Sea Bearers Flame, were another combined arms force, but notable for having a substantial number of Terrans within their ranks some 9,200 marines in total. Tolv, the 12th Great Company, the Shield Gnawers, supplemented the 3rd with close infantry support formations, but bolstered by heavy armor divisions, and consisted of 8,700 Astartes in total. Finally, Dek Tra, the 13th Great Company, the Corpse Renders, were 600 strong, the smallest of the company elements committed, and consisted of light assault and pursuit infantry squads. Sesk, the sixth, and Deck, the tenth, were absent in their entirety from the muster, unable to either disengage from their campaigns or make it to beat a Garmin in time. With the wolves massing and waiting the arrival of Valdor, the Sensior host was joined by a surprising but not exactly unexpected contingent. 5,000 Astartes in the sea green of the newly renamed 16th Legion, the Sons of Horus. The War Master had not elected to sit idle as the censor host committed to its duty, and had committed a full battalion of his legion, conspicuously arrayed as a line of battle unit and not as a ceremonial detachment. The Sons of Horus were not alone either as with Valdor's oncoming contingent were accompanied by Exertus Imperialis troops. 9,000 soldiers of the 19th Chthonian Headhunters, 4,000 of the 3rd Idranian Seekers, and 8,000 soldiers from the 73rd and 75th Echelons of the Host of Brass. Notably, all three of these divisions had either combat history against, notable hatred of, or specialized equipment for, the Psyker. Not only men, Horus also bade the Legio Mortis, his most favored Titan Legion, to provide twelve god engines for the host, two full maniples and one demi maniple, headed by the warlord class Eterna Virtus under the command of Princeps Maldus Drain. The head of the Warmaster's detachment was Overseer Boros Kern, commander of the 16th Independent Assault Battalion. His rank was a relatively newly created one, following the 16th Legion's Davin incident. Kern was purportedly an intense and driven figure who requested, as emissary of the supreme military authority outside the Imperial household, to meet with the Wolf King at the earliest opportunity. He had, so he claimed, special instructions from the War Master himself, based upon the latest information Horus had in his possession. What Kern bore precisely, what Russ was told, what Horus said, none of this has ever been revealed to any scholar. It is likely that the only persons who ever knew just what was in that communique are Russ and Horus. 
and perhaps those they held closest counsel with. But it goes without saying that we mortals will never be parley to it. All that is known, for Ross was vocal about the new resolve that lay within his heart, is that this was no longer a mission of capture. This was a death sentence. He intended to execute Magnus the Red. Much has been made over the millennia of this turn of judgment at so late a date. It had been months since the declaration of the writ of censure by the Emperor, even adjusting for warp dilation. Russ was widely known as the Emperor's executioner, a dog held at his side until the moment the leash was slipped and the jaws were sank into the throat of those his master bade him murder make. The loyalty of Russ was as famous as his bloodthirsty reputation. He was no insane butcher like his brother Angron. His was a fury fully contained until the moment he chose to release it. Many chroniclers have thus tended to paint Russ as a victim of circumstance, corrupted to the purpose of the war master against his will, tricked by the perfidious Lupercal and his cloying words. Loic Gerentius, in his seminal Lamentations upon the Age of Darkness, falls prey to this, a notable flaw within his work being a tendency that many others have shared, to lionize those Primarchs that sayed said fast to the throne while damning the insidious wretches that betrayed it. If one is to remain true to scholarly rigors, we must discount this and admit to ourselves the extant possibility. Russ wanted Magnus dead. Horus merely provided an excuse. It is historical fact that there was no love lost between kings, both Wolf and Crimson. There was outright hostility. Aside from being as unlike in character as any of the siblings had been, Russ firmly believed his learned brother's meddling in Warpcraft was a dire and fundamental threat to the Imperium, believing none but their father capable of such study. As an example, the tension is best explored in the events surrounding the Battle of Heliosa, where both legions had been tasked with the conquest of a unity-resistant world of ancient human provenance. In typical Thousand Suns doctrine, Magnus had prioritized the capture and codification of the planet's records, considering the millennia-old culture worth saving in whatever aspects remained. Russ, by contrast, was committing what the Cyclops called senseless genocide. What resulted was a standoff between both Primarchs and their legion echelons at the city's central library, culminating in Russ and his wolves charging the 15th legion only to be disabled by the Suns' psychic powers. This, however, resulted in one of the Fifteenth, a warrior named Hastar, succumbing to the flesh change for the first time since the Legion had been cured of it by their Primarch. Thrown into panic at the re-emergence of a curse they had long thought lost, the Fifteenth were helpless to prevent Russ from executing Hastar on the spot. Magnus and the Wolf King almost came to blows, until the intervention of their brother Lorgar, who was assisting in the operation. This is only one example. The most recent and damning was Russ's own testimony at the Council of Nikia, where, flanked by his own rune priest psychers, he had been the most vocal and passionate of Magnus's critics. The wolves were, and are to this day, Astartes of contradictions. Russ, no exception. He damned his brother a sorcerer while accompanied by his legion's own openly practicing psychers, all of whom continued their shamanistic Fenrisian rites after the passing of the Nikian Edict, in open violation of both it and the Imperial Truth both. Russ was ever willing to clad himself in the rough appearance of a barbarian king, but it has been noted by chronicles both contemporary and subsequent that this was a carefully constructed facade, that of the drunken oafish lout, to disguise the calculating viciousness that lay beneath. The Wolf King would of course never deny this. He had no need to. The views of others mattered not one iota to him, and his legion followed his example. Neither courted kinship with any of their cousins, nor Russ with his siblings. Those who could stand or enjoy their company did so. Those who did not, they paid no heed. Loyalty to the Emperor was the only thing that mattered to him 
and to the wolves. The Sixth Legion did not build, nor inspire, nor uplift. They existed to destroy, built for that purpose alone. In many ways, it was a role they shared with the First Legion Dark Angels and their detached, mysterious Primarch, the Lion, that of a weapon, and one unconcerned with being anything other than that. This all being said, the wolves clearly relished their role far more than the angels did, savoring the fearful glances and tense exchanges with those of the Imperium that they made uncomfortable. It is uncertain where content detachment ends and egotistical image projection begins with them, and their Primarch. We know so little of both, due to their own partialities and the passages of time, to do anything but infer. This all must be considered in precisely why the Wolves and Rus were selected for the role of primary Astartes cohort within the Censor host. It is not as if other legions were not available at the time. The Seventh Legion Imperial Fists and their Primarch Rogel Dorn were serving on Terra as Praetorians to the throne world in their near entirety, and outnumbered the Wolves in sheer numerical disposition to boot. The Fourth Legion Iron Warriors had thousands of Astartes to spare, and a Primarch unconcerned with the arithmetic of spending his warriors' lives as coin to achieve this. The Twentieth Legion Alpha Legion could appear as if from nowhere with precisely the right amount of warriors a task demanded. Even the First Legion Dark Angels could serve as the ultimate weapon of the Emperor's writ with ease. It was, essentially, the entire purpose of their existence. Without a full picture of the entirety of all Astartes' deployments across the entirety of the Great Crusade, we must fall to one conclusion. The Emperor wanted Lee Man Rus, Magnus's most furious critic, to lead this. It is historical fact that numerous assignments the Wolves undertook during their existence have been utterly redacted from record, and it was an open secret in the Divisio Militaris and amongst the Primarchs that the title of Emperor's Executioner was one Russ had earned well, being his father's favoured instrument of annihilation, especially to traitors to the Imperium. Was his selection merely just a prudent one? To include, on so dangerous a mission, a Primarch that would not balk at taking the life of another, should it fall to that? To one's mind, no. There were others who could have done so, and without blinking. The Lion, for one. Alpharius Omegon, for another. Perhaps even Horus himself, although we need not explore that one further. Russ was not the only candidate for this mission. But he was the most eager. Perhaps this was uh, tacit approval. Not said, for it could never be said. But uh, approval by proxy an acknowledgement that the Emperor did not believe Magnus would surrender, and that his life must be ended by any means necessary. A means by which the Emperor could maintain the appearance of justice and benevolence, while in his mind being resolved to the most brutal and bloody outcome of the situation. It is, if I may say, not exactly out of character for him to do so and even less out of character for a regime such as his. That is, of course, all I can say upon the matter. We have the exacting strictures of the Magi of the Beta Garmin Forges to thank for more evidence of the Wolf King's change of heart. Per their meticulous record-keeping, we know that the War Master had ordered the Forges to open their arsenals to the Wolves, ordering their access to even the most dangerous and otherwise prohibited weaponry. While the Wolf King naturally used the opportunity to resupply the great companies that had otherwise not had the chance to replenish their stocks, he and his legion eagerly availed themselves of the forbidden technologies previously denied to them, or to which their access had been strictly limited. According to logs, this included a quantity of phosphex, the corrosive and unstoppably flammable compound that was nearly impossible to extinguish, that would normally be considered too much even for a system-wide purgation campaign, 
as well as numerous exterminatus-grade munitions delivered to the Legion's capital ships. Several of these were bioalchemic phage saturation warheads of a lethality that had seen their usage within established imperial borders completely outlawed, having been utilized only for the most thorough and dire of alien purges, such as the Rangdan Xenocides. The Legion's death sworn were recorded to have placed exorbitant demands for personal ammunition that far outstripped the requirements of even the most dangerous of crusade operations. By the time the Terran contingent under Constantine Valdor arrived a month after the Wolves, the Custodians found a Legion armed to the fangs with war gear suitable for the most horrific of campaigns. Indeed, it was noted that the Legion of Rus appeared to be gearing up for yet another Rangdan Xenocide, rather than an escort for a wayward son of the Emperor. Remembrancers embedded into the Terran wing recorded quite vividly a series of intense and fractious strategic planning meetings held between Russ and Valdor and their senior staffs. Ironically, for two beings of unshakable loyalty to the Emperor, they had arrived at entirely separate conclusions of what his writ of censure bade them do. While Russ was not exactly open in the saying of it, he had clearly decided to that point that Magnus must die, whereas Valdor would not deviate one iota from the orders of the Emperor to bring the Crimson King to Terra alive. Senior command staff were routinely dismissed from these meetings for the two to talk alone. Both were warriors known to have a deep respect for each other's abilities and characters, but it was obvious to any that what relationship they had previously had was fracturing under the differing goals of their combined mission. While Valdor, bearer of the Imperial Magisterium Ultima, was nominally the most senior legal official of the expedition, Russ, as son of the Emperor himself, and operating under hidden orders from the War Master, was for all intents and purposes the Emperor's proxy in the censure host, forcing the Captain General to accede to his authority. Valdor's role and loyalty forced him into this position. If there had ever been personal feelings about this, he would have never let them be known. We of course know little of the content of these meetings beyond their historical outcomes. Russ, additionally, ordered the dismissal of all civilian remembrancers from the censure host prior to their departure from Beta Garmin. Never a Primarch that had supported the initiative in the first place, the Wolf King would not even consider their inclusion, deeming whatever he intended to occur upon Prospero was not for the eyes of any but the highest of the Imperium, and definitely not fit for public historical record. What we know of what followed is only the result of a careful preservation of material that was redacted at the highest level, and yours truly has had viewership of only thanks to the writ of authorities yet higher. The revisions Russ demanded to the overall plan of action, held secret from all but the senior staff, took very little time. The Wolf King was deeply eager to be underway. Terra had rendered for the host's service its finest navigators, allowing the fleet to utilize warp corridors not typically plied by military starships. This was both to prevent the fleet from being waylaid by any unforeseen warp experiences, but given the prevailing immaterial currents at the time, the route selected was considered far faster than approaching Prospero by any conventional means. Crucially, too, it would also outmaneuver worlds known to have 15th Legion elements stationed upon them. The censor host was not intended necessarily to be a surprise for the Thousand Suns, the writ of censure having been broadcast throughout the entirety of the Imperium. That Russ sought to disguise its approach, it speaks to the degree with which he was now treating the Cyclops as an enemy, not a brother, denying him the ability to muster or even prepare in advance. Thus, the doom of Magnus made full wake barreling towards the unsuspecting Thousand Suns with the fury of a wolf pack unleashed. Its coming was the result of many moving parts, both personal and situational, a tragedy of unspeakable sorrow that would soon break upon the shores of the Imperium and of history. Yet for its full telling, we do however require yet further study of its participants. Until such a time, Ave Imperator. 
Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.